All right, well, welcome uh, to the IIoT World Manufacturing Supply Chain Day and our session on uh, securing the evolution of cyber physical systems. Um, and it, just to level of set, everybody, cyber physical systems is a broad category, uh, which certainly includes manufacturing and, and as we talk about supply chain as well. Um, but you're in the right place uh, from, a, from a manufacturing standpoint that, that's all encompassing. Um, other aspects of this is, includes infrastructure and that type of thing, but largely our focus is going to be in the, in the manufacturing space. Um, but yeah, so excited to uh, talk to you today um, about the uh, cyber physical world, cybersecurity, manufacturing, um, some of the risks, some of the upsides, um, and then how to really um, in embark or enhance on your journey uh, as we look to secure a critical manufacturing infrastructure um, and keep those lines running. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and go through some introductions. Uh, again, I, I'm Rich Springer. I'm the uh, head of uh, OT Solutions Marketing uh, for Fortinet. And um, so with the, my esteemed panel here, uh, what I'd like to do is just have you go through a little bit of, of your background, your organization, and then just a little bit of a highlight about what you're securing uh, in, the, in this broad environment. So with that, I'll turn to Mike. Uh, Mike, why don't you go ahead and go first? Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, Mike Ellers here. I'm the Global Information Security Manager uh, for Olin. Uh, been here about three years, been in the industry for a long time, 25 years plus. And um, kind of getting into what we're securing and being responsible for architecture, strategy, engineering operations here. Obviously, you know, whether it's IT or OT that comes under you know, my responsibility. And you have to look at what, what I'm protecting is, you know, anything from the endpoint out to manufacturing, um, perimeter on in, you know, any, anything in which a packet flows and where it's flowing, that, that's what we're worried about. Obviously, we're trying to prevent anything from coming in and hitting the corporate network that isn't supposed to. Uh, but then you're looking at, looking at the Purdue model, which we'll talk about, probably more on in our conversation here and how we're using that to protect the manufacturing, where we make widgets, what's our bread and butter. Um, you know, that that's the focus and how do we make sure that Purdue models are added correctly across all the plants. Um, and there's, there's lots of pieces to that, which we'll get into shortly. Cool. Thanks. So I can, um, and I, I always, you're foreshadowing the IT and OT and, and how do these things uh, work. So it's going to be interesting to hear your perspective on that. But with, uh, let's continue on the introductions. Uh, Brian, go ahead and I'll have you tell us about your uh, manufacturing customers um, and how they're how they're going about this. Oop, Brian, looks like you might be on mute. Uh oh. Am I the only one not hearing Brian right now? Not hearing. Hey, he's on mute. We, we can't okay. hear. Yeah, move on to the next one and we'll bring. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go. Let's shift gears. Let's go to Stephen. Uh, and so, Stephen, um, just give you know, some of your background and, and your perspective with your membership. Um, and then also, so what you see um, transforming in this in this cyber world. Sure. No, uh, Stephen Gold, I'm the CEO of Manufacturers Alliance. A little, we're a little different here. We're not a, a manufacturing company. We're actually a manufacturing leadership network. Uh, we undertake research. We provide peer benchmarking, professional development for leaders across uh, manufacturing enterprises from ops to finance to, to business strategy to legal and, and HR. Um, and our, our members, just the level set, you know, our members are primarily mid to large cap industrial manufacturers, the B2B uh, with global markets. So we're talking about some fairly sophisticated companies here. Um, in terms of what we're hearing from our members, you know, first of all, let's just say digital transformation is table stakes, right? Everybody's involved in connectivity is the name of the game, you know, whether it's on the shop floor, whether it's between plants, between ops and supply chains, which of course means that the, um, the risk of an attack increases with every additional level of cyber physical connection. So I'm just going to note, I'm going to be the data guy. We just did a really good study with Fortinet, big, a good survey that can, we came up with chock, you know, chock full of data. And I'll just start by saying 82% um, of the respondents that we did with our recent survey, which you can find on Fortinet's website on ours, 82% of respondents ranked ineffective communication between IT and OT as a key barrier 
to mm. effective cyber risk management. And interestingly, the IT respondents were much more positive than the OT counterparts <laughs> about the quality of the collaboration. And I'm assuming that's because this is a new game for OT. There's a learning curve for their uh, that their IT counterparts have already overcome. So that's what we'll be getting more into uh, as we go along here. Yeah, I, I will just say being more on the OT side and an operator, I'll say that there's less, you know, there's, there's a, something new on each side, you know, um, and so it's a brave new world there. So, all right, well, let's uh, get back to uh, Brian. Brian, are you with us now? I think so. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Absolutely, oh. Brian. So go ahead and uh, go ahead and swing away and tell us about your uh, your manufacturing customers in yeah, your space. Sure. Thanks, Richard. Thanks all for, for being online here with us today. My name is Brian Deacon. I'm the North America Commercial Manager for Rockwell Automation's Networks and Cybersecurity Services business based out of Atlanta, Georgia here. Been with uh, Rockwell and in the automation industry for 20 plus years, going on 23, I think, but you lose count <laughs> most days. Um, I, I have a, a privileged seat a lot of days, um, an eye-opening seat a lot of days to work with a really, really wide range of customers in the industrial space. Obviously, Rockwell Automation customers, and especially in North America, and the market share here present lots of opportunities for us to go get engaged with our customers. However, some of our customers buy no Rockwell Automation whatsoever. And so that tells you how holistically, um, how broad, um, how agnostically folks need to approach cybersecurity. We really work from a standards-based alignment that includes NIST and IEC 62443. So earlier when Mike spoke about the Purdue model, that's close and near and dear to my heart, but as well as uh, the, the NIST alignment and, and looking and, and working with customers anywhere where they're on their journey. And it's uh, it's quite a ride to, to think about where customers' maturities points are today, where they should be, but those who, who have been embarking on this journey and all the things that they've learned along the way, um, but but the long, long way we have to go in the daily battle that we fight uh, against cybercrime and all the bad things that can and, and seem likely to happen. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, gentlemen. And um, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to go to a poll uh, because some of the things we're talking about here when we talk about risk and we talk about journey and we talk about maturity, a lot of this is based on funding. And funding usually comes from prioritization. So what we'd like to do with the audience is to actually find out where your priority is as far as cybersecurity um, in your business, uh, whether that be in the manufacturing floor and the supply chain aspect of it. But where is cybersecurity ranked as far as a, a corporate priority or maybe within the CISO? Um, you know, so give us your relative perspective on, on where that lies. And so we'll give that a second. Um, and I can... You know, I can tell you from personal experience, we have, I've had commentary that it was top 10 and now it's five or it was five and now it's three. So we see a, a, a um, you know, an upward trajectory of prioritization uh, from my perspective and the various customers you deal with. Um, and so with that, let's see if we can see some results here, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Well, all right. So Obviously, top five and you know and above is what seventy six percent, almost three quarters, um, with top ten, and then and a small percentage of that being ten percent will say you know below top ten or don't know. Um, so again, heavily weighted on that top priority, and then um, you know it's uh, it's I guess I think this is where we're at in the world right now. Is that top three priority is it certainly has elevated there. So interesting insights. Um, thank you so much for contributing. It's uh, interesting to see that. Okay, well, let's um, go ahead and proceed uh, with the agenda here. And with that, I've got, you know, a, um, uh, sorry, I've got a list of questions to um, take our panel through. And the first one's gonna be a, kind of at the highest level here, but, um, what we've seen over the past years is that we were reading about more attacks in the manufacturing space. Um, and we also know a lot of things don't get into the high, you know, the headlines, but CISOs and other security minded folks are, are kind of aware. And, and then it's, you know, as we see these stakes and, and the impact raising for organization, um, you know, let's talk about that risk. Let's just talk about, you know, how this has increased over time 
um, and then also talk about how that is balanced with our need for connectivity and, and digitalization and industry 4.0. So, so we've got some balancing act go on here. So, so Brian, why don't you go ahead and go first and, and tell us about what you're seeing from as far as the risk and then the upside as well. Yeah, you know, Mike and I spoke about this earlier in the week, but and in, in earlier here in just the call, we all know that digital transformation is is taking its 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 hold. It has been for a long time. It's nothing new to talk about ITOT convergence. Some days I talk about ITOT divergence. It's really interesting to sit in customer meetings and you bring the IT folks and you bring the OT folks and they still sit on opposite ends of the room. Um, <laughs> but the most mature organizations are those who have the most mature and organized ITOT structure is really what I'm saying that there are there are folks and organizations I know who named their ITOT organizations Tito, not not Tito's like the vodka, but ITO for OTI backwards. And so that told me right away that that was a very mature organization. The fact that they had organized their teams into an ITOT organization. There are other organizations with best practices to take an OT resource and put them on the IT team. And the IT team wouldn't make decisions without the OT resource in that room and their input and vice versa. The OT folks wouldn't go ahead and make decisions without the IT folks um, decision-making input. So it's really interesting to see what IT, OT convergence really means now <clears throat> in the of cyber physical, cyber security, because the security has been going on a long time, right? We're not talking about that many banks being hacked into anymore. They use simple things like dual factor authentication on a very regular basis. We're still learning how to change our passwords in the OT. <laughs> yeah. I think there's some good points you bring up, Brian, and just kind of follow up on what you're saying. Um, you know, we could sit and talk all day about the 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 IP stack and the technical risks, um, and we'll probably do that in a little bit anyway. <clears throat> but I think I'll stick to that kind of kind of the path you were going down and looking at from a people and a strategy perspective that there's there's been a lot of risk there and that's some of the challenge that the IT staff has to date and it, it's not perfect you talked about people sitting at other ends of the table one of the one of the big risks of fixing OT strategy is getting engagement and getting folks to recognize there is risk um, we talk about connectivity um, you know, the simple things of if manufacturing organizations have flat networks or networks to some degree of flatness where, where there's no separation from the business to the OT, just getting someone to realize that that is the biggest risk they have, you know, spelling Purdue um, is huge. And you need a change advocate. One of the biggest things to go fix that and help that is that you got to find a change advocate in the company that can be that liaison from the IT organization, from security, from teams like mine. Find that person in the organization that understands and, and buys into what you're telling them. You know, whatever it takes to get that advocate, go find sometimes it's a top-down approach, right? Um, and then let that person help you spread that message, get that buy-in. That is, I've seen that successful. I've done that. Um, whether it's this life here where I'm at Olin or past lives of other companies, that's what the key is without that you'll show up on their front door and they'll go, what in the heck are you talking about? And why should I pay attention to you? So, yeah. um, cause they got more important things to do in their mind. They got to make widgets, right? That's where their performance is at where we have security or not. You know, that doesn't matter to a lot of times to them, understandably. So until they can't make their product anymore because their system's down because somebody just hacked into them. So it's a really a proactive measure. It's getting that change advocate. And that is a huge risk. It's not technical risk. It's a people risk and it's a messaging risk. And, and I, of course I come in with a slightly different uh, perspective. Uh, you know, we're, we're a thought leader where our job is to kind of provide guidance and, and, and data and such. Um, and so, and again, I told you I'm going to be the numbers guy here, but I'll start with the fact that we, we were fortunate to have Mike Hayden. He's the former CIA NSA director about a decade ago, and he came in and talked to our board. And I remember he said, um, you know, there's three, back then, a decade ago, three types of hackers. You got the nation states, you got the anarchist activists, they're the ones who just want to create chaos, and you have the organized criminal gangs. Well, for manufacturers, organized criminals now pose the greatest threat. Manufacturing is the now it's the top targeted industry for cyber criminals now. One out of every four attacks on businesses 
is on manufacturers around the world. And it, it doesn't help that manufacturers pay ransom more often than any other industries, which is probably why ransom dollars now are higher than other industries, which is, it's simply to say manufacturers are a greater risk than ever before now. Because while all business and all personal networks, including mine, including yours, all of our networks are at risk, with Industry 4.0, manufacturers' networks are, are now connected to the lifeblood of their companies. That's their operational technology. And that actually poses not a financial risk, that poses an existential threat to manufacturers. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And and I think, you know, with, uh, you mentioned our joint survey and, and we have a another focus survey and then we have our FortiGuard labs. Um, so we have focus on OT threat intelligence and and you, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's certainly a focus towards manufacturing. And, and so what we've seen, again, with the publicity and the, and the occurrence of these manufacturing events is that the, the bad actors were approaching it from a data or maybe an intellectual property standpoint. They weren't really monetizing what happens if I stop that production. You know, in, in Colonial Pipeline, if I bridge over to cyber physical systems, is, it's just one of those things where it's, it was a billing system, but stop the pipeline for two weeks. And then there's millions on top of that because of that revenue, right? And that wasn't boiled into the ransom. So, so yeah, they're starting to monetize and understand what is being produced um, as adding to, you know, that typical ransom, uh, you know, play out. So interesting. Um, I also thought it was interesting commentary about the OTIT piece of it. Um, again, just sharing on best practices piece, the I think it's, again, collaborating up front, understanding each other's priorities, and then trying to find win, you know, win-win amongst the two teams. And sometimes that's as simple as patching. You know, I need to patch devices for the sake of reliability, but it's also for security. Um, let's go both get that done. You know, so there are some win-wins out there to help bridge and, and, and hopefully get the teams to work together. So um, let's dig down a little bit farther here. We talked about kind of risk high level in you know, globally and so forth. But but now let's just talk about the actual attack, you know, and, and that attack was either it could be, again, at a company, and this could be at the enterprise level that somehow gets itself into the OT or manufacturing space or it impacts the manufacturing space. Mm -hmm. But there's also the supply chain piece of it too, right? If you have a key supplier who has an event and then that supply chain breaks down, you know, how does that impact you know, the manufacturing space as well. So with that, and then it's really about the leadership, because if I go back to prioritization and go back to budgeting, it's really about that leadership. So um, I'd like the panel to talk about kind of all of this awareness and then how far down are their tabletop you know, exercises? You know, what is the, the ability to quantify this risk and is that getting to leadership? So, um, you know, Brian, I'll have you start off with this. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, yeah, Brian, go ahead. And then I'll go to Steve and then Mike. Yeah, sure. I, I'll spend too much time here and let the rest of the panel talk. But I think we, yeah. we hit on it early on is supply chain resilience. You know, people aren't talking about it as cybersecurity per se, but they're raising the stakes with supply chain resiliency. Uh, COVID certainly exposed that to a lot of organizations. It's really interesting that some folks didn't necessarily think of themselves as part of the supply chain until they were a broken part of the supply chain. It, it really, really made people understand that if they were not able to do what they were able to do and what they do, the company would no longer exist anymore. So it has to be in the top priority. And if cybersecurity is something where a ransomware attack or an operational shutdown due to some sort of cyber cyber intrusion, cyber incident, and it breaks that, um, it, it breaks that supply chain, the, the legal liabilities now throughout the world, especially in the United States with disclosure acts anymore, just from the SEC. I mean, I, I read a very interesting article the other day that uh, a cyber criminal had, had created a cyber attack. They reported the cyber attack to the SEC and saying that the company didn't disclose the attack within 72 hours because they knew that they had attacked them. So, I mean, <laughs> you talk about being a really, really harsh criminal you're attacking them and, and then you might sue them for not disclosing the attack as an investor of that company. But obviously that's not the way that's going to play out, but mm -hmm. it, it, it goes to show that the, the importance of understanding resiliency in the supply chain is becoming hypercritical and hyper-focused. And if cyber drives that, that, that that's a good thing for us. Um, um, or, or cyber protection drives that for us. That's a good thing. 
Yeah. Steven, I'll come back to you. Go ahead. Uh, me, yeah. So, uh, first of all, my, my, my fellow panelists here are going to be able to talk more about personal experience uh, because obviously, they, whether they admit it or not, I'm highly confident uh, companies have been hacked at some point. Um, I, I do want to say that um, I write an industry week column and I, I began my most recent column, I think it's supposed to be published this week. Uh, with this way, I said, a, a CISO, a CIO, and a chief manufacturing officer walk into a bar. Unfortunately, this isn't the start of a joke They're at the bar because they really need a tip drink. Uh, and, um, you know, when, when cyber risks first took on some prominence, again, about a decade ago, the primary concern about businesses really was it was ID theft. It was extortion, which is still a major thing. Uh, and while phishing and... Um, Spoofing are still the primary ways that bad guys get in the back door. Operational concerns are up there now with financial concerns. And 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 I'm I'm just gonna before I get into the data because I want again I want to note that Fortinet um, Manufacturers Alliance study. I do want to say you mentioned um, you know the Colonial Pipeline, but this spring was a ransomware attack on Dole. It forced it to shut down production plants in North America and halted food shipments to its grocery stores. Uh, this is all. I'm not saying anything you don't know. You, all you have to do is read the newspapers. There was an attack on Clorox involving a, a social engineering scheme. It forced the company to lock up its system, which led to downtime at plants. And this is affecting both upstream supply and downstream dis distribution. It's, it's costing millions of dollars. And, and these aren't one-offs. Of the OT breaches, this comes from our survey now, of the <coughs> that, that, that our members experienced in the past year, 43% were operational outages that affected productivity. 29% were operational um, uh, outages that affected revenue. 26% involved the loss of business critical data. Think Boeing, and we all know what happened to Boeing. 34% involved the loss of personal info uh, in terms of their employees and contractors. And every single one of these attacks shut down not only the production, but distribution and often supply as well, since all the network <clears throat> devices had to be disabled. So clearly, there's a lot more at risk today than there was a decade ago. Yeah. Yeah, Mike, go ahead and, and take us take us to the table uh, as far as how, and speak again openly, uh, obviously, about other colleagues and so forth, or you can give us perspective from Olin as well. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I can say it better than Stephen just pointed out with the different statistics. Um, on what is at risk, you, you, you covered the gamut, um, you know, but just you know, 10 seconds or less in summarizing the obvious things are at stake, your crown jewels, whether it's your formula, your financial data, um, personal information, um, you know, things, whether it's your social security number, your HR data, all, all those things are at risk. I mean, I'm not saying anything anyone's probably not already thinking about, but then you get down past that to the next level. Again, we're talking Purdue, you're getting into the manufacturing pieces. Um, you're not going to make product if you are shut down, which was just shown it's possible. There are, there's, there's ways to get in there and, and bad actors going after that stuff. So they're after your, they're after your sensitive personal information, you know, and they're after your, they're going to want to stop manufacturing a lot of times with the ransomware pieces. Um, I, I think, I think the, the thing to consider here, and we're going to continue talking about this in the rest of our time here is these things are all at risk. You know, I think you know, very soon here, we need to be talking about how are we, what, what's the tangible takeaways that people are not thinking about to go protect that risk, to mm -hmm. limit and mitigate that risk. I think that's some of the most important things that, you know, we, we can probably help people take away from here. I mean, and, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that, probably that next session here, next question or two to help, help people yeah. understand those items. Yeah, so let's let's go ahead and take that segue. And so, <clears throat> I, I think the the way I like to look at this is like the denial is over. I mean, the risk is tangible, um, and then we're again we're still relatively immature in this as far as the manufacturing part of it is new, the heightened attacks, and and then how we're bubbling up that risk and reacting to it. So reacting to it, Mike, I'll take your cue. Is that you know now we're talking about implementation, right? How do we actually get this stuff done? Um, and so three legs of the stool, people, process, and technology. Um, and so these play out in, in most projects as, you know, as well as in cyber. Um, so Mike, take us through that. Like, talk to us about those three different aspects and, and then any, you know, 
uh, maybe lessons learned or some of your experiences and, and again with uh, colleagues as well about how how you get those three legs of stool <laughs> built and leveled um, in order to build this cyber security platform. Yeah, so here, here's probably 10 or 20 years worth of notes in about one or two minutes, right? Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, obviously, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> We've got time, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, we we uh, you got to have a framework that you're basing your security footprint from. You know, if, if you're not doing anything else, obviously, looking at the NIST cybersecurity framework and that model, and looking at the 18 modules of that, and digging in your eyes into the words. What does that mean? Do I have do I have um, the people, processes, and tools and technology to go implement that framework? And if your answer is no, what are you doing to go meet those demands? I mean, it's a combination of, we talked about the people. You got to have the advocates um, both on the IT side and the OT side. On the IT side, you got to have the funding. You got to have communications to our, to our board, right? They're going to, you know, and on down to go get the funding. We talked about that already. So let's say we've, we've got their attention. I think a moment ago, Richard, people are, are, are less less denial, you said a moment ago. So now we got the funding. We got the advocates on the OT side. Now we got to move into what's the plan? What am I really doing? Purdue has to be part of that conversation. If you're a manufacturing shop and you do not know what Purdue is, that, that's one of your first steps. Go get the NIST right, cybersecurity framework. Look at those 18 modules. What am I doing? You know, each one of those has a few key topics, right? What am I doing to protect at the perimeter? Do you have next generation firewalls in place? Do you have your IPS running? Not just your IDS, those are days of old. Go get the IPS running, right? If, do, we gotta, do you have all the IOCs? Do you have that service running properly? You're getting your updates hourly, not daily or weekly or monthly, right? It, it's, it's real time. That's how fast the data is moving. Um, do you have your, do you have your email security gateways in place? Is Defender the only thing you're looking at for Microsoft? Maybe you ought to be asking that question. Is that enough? You know what's protecting your endpoint? You got to have endpoint security. So you got all these different things you have to secure. Are you still in the days of old where you think a signature based endpoint protection tool is enough? Uh, wow, that's that's twenty year old technology, right? It has to be an AI platform. There are key manufacturers. You can go Google AI endpoint antivirus protections, and I can guarantee you what the top three or four pieces you're going to get come up in that Google search. Names that we've all heard. Um, those are the players that you have to have in your system these days to do the protection. Are you doing vulnerability management? What is vulnerability management? Right. These are all part of of that model. Um, that you, if you're looking at the NIST cybersecurity framework, you're looking at those 18 modules, do I have tools and processes that impact every one of those? And if when you go and ask, and we're being honest, and we're looking in the mirror go, no, I don't have that. Do I have an intranet site that has all my policies, procedures, and standards on it? No, I don't even know where they're at in the company. Do you even have standards written for security? Where, where's where's your global network procedure? Where's your global cybersecurity standard? Where, do those things exist? Right, that's part of the that's part of the people, process, and technology piece. But getting a framework and understanding what am I doing to impact every one of those items in that framework, and until those items are met by standards, which are the processes, and when, and when until they're met by a tool to help with those processes to turn the no, which is a red, you know, a green, red, green, yellow, red light type approach, and you turn those things green, you're not done. I mean, we're never done, but you're not even close to having a footprint of protection. And that, and we talk about the Purdue model. Um, let's get in that for just a moment, if you don't mind. I'm sorry for spilling so long. But, <laughs> okay, go um, ahead. <laughs> but let's talk about the Purdue model. You have got to stop having flat networks. This is probably the biggest thing you can do. Separate your production with next generation firewalls from the business network. Get them separate. They don't even talk to each other. And if understanding Purdue, you do not allow the business networks which are traditionally classified as levels five, four, and three, right? There's there's six levels, right? You got two, one, and zero on the other side of mm -hmm. that of that um, OT firewall, that, that, that blocking point, right? You don't let those systems initiate communications into level two. I can guarantee you right now, if you are a flat network and you have somebody angry or you get fished or spammed, you know, you can get hacked like that. It is that easy. 
that's easy. But if you put those parameters, you put these protections in place, especially separating the network, these are very tangible ideas that I'm, I'm trying to give here, takeaways. I love when I sit on these sessions, I get some tangible things to take away. <laughs> what can I do that's next right. versus a bunch of bunch of folks talking and go, well, now what do I do? What did they tell me to do? I don't know. So right. I'm trying to get some really tangible things to take away. Yeah. We gotta, you got to change what you're doing. You got to have a model, implement Purdue. Again, if you don't know what that is, go find somebody that does. Go, yeah. go do the reading. Go understand all these things. This is how you're going to protect your manufacturing. Um, right. We could talk for hours, like I said, on this or yeah. you know, on how we do. But these yeah. are the highlights. Mike, this yeah. is real, real quick, Richard. I don't yeah. remember the point anymore. But you know, Mike and I don't know each other. I don't know what capacities we work together between Rockwell and Olin, to be totally honest with you. But from a cybersecurity perspective, you, you speak the language of standards. And so when you talk about Purdue models, you talk about IEC 62443, exactly. And so that people continue to ask all the time about where to get started. Well, get started with the thing that you can do, right? We talked about changing your passwords and change your password to something other than the password that you had before. Because when you talk about vulnerability management, that'll come back and it could be written in your policy and procedure to change your password, but you need to change it to something different than the password that it was before, just changing it again. But those are the types of things that, that have to happen. The approach is incredibly methodical at the end of the day. And NIST is a very, very good guideline. The reason NIST is stuck around, the reason NIST has become a global standard, more or less, the reason they become it became NIST 2.0 with a governance framework around this is because it does work. It simplifies an approach for everybody. It outlines a beginning, a middle, and an end. And it's never ending, it's circular in nature, and it allows for a methodical approach with an answer that aligns back to standards everywhere you turn and everywhere you go. And until you check all those yeah. boxes, and until you continue to check them on a very regular basis, you will continue to be at exposed risk. Yeah, that's right. And go ahead, Stephen, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm just gonna say, um, if, 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 so, so we have peer groups on logistics and quality and supply chain and, manufacturing operations we've got CISAs, you know so and i have two technology and process experts here and such but i'm just going to say um the biggest weakness in the system is and i can only be blunt about it it's employee carelessness it, it, or, or occasionally intentionally malicious actions of employees but it's almost always employee carelessness the site you know the cyber criminals quickest way uh, it, 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 and through the back door is uh, employees letting them in, and and we everybody knows that, uh, you know, through phishing, through spoofing, it's uh, via email. Now it's via cell phone. And I noticed somebody said, you know, on here, you know, they're asking about budgets um, uh, for this. But the number one thing that we still hear among our members, with everything else, you technology is going to play a huge role. In the process is training, training, training. It is. If you can, if you had a hundred percent of your employees not clicking on links, suspicious links in their emails and their cell phones and such, you would actually prevent. A, a, I can't say a majority, but perhaps probably a majority of the incidences that our members are now experiencing. And it's a great point. Guess what? One of the controls is whether you look at CMMC certification, DFAR certification, or you look at the NIST model. Security awareness is on all of those, right? Yeah. You can't pass any of them. You can't fit into the model without having a security awareness program. It's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I we're gonna we're gonna move on a little bit here and I'm gonna turn to Brian, but I just uh, I wanted to come just kind of put a bow on this piece with the the, the NIST cybersecurity framework. It's a great uh, kind of pillar, if you will, to operate out of because it it is you know high arching and, and then you can go into the IEC six two four four three the NIST eight hundred you know, supplements and be very specific when you get, you know, very technical on the OT side. But that NIST piece of it is to allow experienced IT standard cyber hygiene teams to come in and be able to talk to an OT team that's just been focused on production reliability and, and security. They may just be, you know, connecting to the factory for the first time. So it's a new ball game, right? But it's it's a nice way to operate out of centrally and then you can get specific after that. So I think that's again goes back to that win-win that we're on the same page, we're operating under the same charter and and moving forward. So um I wanna as I mentioned uh, with Brian, so again, we talked about the risk, we talked about 
um, some of the uh, you know security documents, if you will, to help get these teams together. We talked about people, process, technology, but we also have layers within the factory of players um, that are interfacing between what our security teams are doing and then how we're affecting the actual components and devices on the factory floor. Brian, you from an automation standpoint, this leads into a question about how you're how how to leverage this ecosystem of you know vendors, uh, uh, automation vendors, um, other, you know, it's, it's a, it's a wild, wild world out there <laughs> in the manufacturing space, but how do you, um, you know, what's some, some thoughts there about leveraging the ecosystem to help support, support the cyber journey? Yeah, I know we keep talking about the three-legged stool and the people processes and the technology. And so I've, I've seen it go wrong at all ends and I've seen it go right <laughs> at two of the three and, and without the third. And so it, it really is not necessarily about best in class as much as it is about best in use. And so I, I really like that because those who are using the technology to their advantages, the technology is excellent. The technology is what will make the difference. But ultimately what makes the difference is the people who are implementing the technology. I've seen people come and rip and replace technology a year later because they've never used it. 450,000 alerts and alarms because you've installed an intrusion detection solution is just a massive amount of noise and confusion and not enough resources to support it. How do you get down to the five and contextualize the five that matter? People change passwords. That's an alert and alarm. People change passwords at three in the morning. Do you know that to be a different alert and alarm? People change passwords at three in the morning after multiple failed login attempts and they do a port scan. If you're ingesting that into an IT SOC and an IT analyst looks at that, they marry a port scan and a multiple failed login attempt and changing passwords to mean that that's something happening in their environment. Probably not. And that's why, you know, Stephen, you can probably speak to this to, to the exact stats, but that's why the, the typical uh, ransomware probably occurred six months before you knew anything about it. People, folks, bad actors are in these environments for a long time before they're ready to go launch payloads and do the things that they do. It's called an APT, Advanced Persistent Threat, for a reason. It's very advanced, they're very persistent, and it's a threat. And that's how they classify the bad actors is by APTs, how advanced they are, how persistent, and how much of a threat they are. So getting the, the, the technology piece right is, is a good thing. It's got to match what your program is trying to do and, and, the, and the tools that you're familiar with, ITOT both sides. But also, how are you implementing that with, with people who know and understand an OT environment. Looking at it through an IT lens only will be 450,000 alerts of an alarm so they already got a bunch of them in their own environments. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Um, Mike, from your your perspective, again, you you're, you own this ecosystem and you you know, have uh, your friends like Brian uh, in the automation side, and then you've got vendors like me and, and various other folks in that space. And then you've got maybe managed services or you've got contractors. I mean, there's just a, a myriad of, of, of things and people and uh, back to the people process technology that have to be managed on top of your own team. So tell us, a, you know, some little bit of, uh, you know, some, maybe some difficulties and maybe even some wins or surprises that you've experienced along the way. Well, I don't think you can beat the horse enough on this uh, NIST cybersecurity framework and the heat map that that can create for you. And when you're trying to make sure where your, your successes and gaps are at, again, what am I doing to make sure that that model has been implemented correctly? That absolutely has million times of impact on your OT environment because you have to protect the perimeter. You have to protect your corporate environment that leads you into the manufacturing space from a connectivity standpoint. So if I'm doing those things right, if I'm doing, you know, we, I didn't even get to mention some, some of the similar things or common things everybody should be doing. And I know people are not, what are they, such as privileged access management that Brian was talking to about passwords. Does anybody rotate their passwords on the servers? Have you ever rotated a password on, on a, an admin account on a server? Think of, think about that <laughs> process. Think about someone if they get access to your domain admin account because the hash is still sitting in memory somewhere or it's sitting on someone's desktop because you don't have that installed. How easy is that? It's things like this, but when you look at that map and you look at the heat map and you've implemented things like that, you are mitigating those risks along the way. Those risks now become less. And how am I leveraging um, different partners and stuff, whether it's Fortinet or or other other folks out there, right? Um, 
it's taking a look at that. I'm not kidding. This is how it happens. You look at the heat map and go, what, what, what do I need help from? What tools am I going to? Okay, this is a concept. I don't have privilege access manual. Who's the leaders in that? But you look at the magic quadrant or you're going to go talk to some other experts out there and go get that resolved, right? That's where the vendors start coming in. How am I going to do next generation um, firewall protection, right? I'm going to go talk to some of the big players probably out there. Oh, we, we know who those are. Fortinet's one of those. Um, how am I going to do my IPS? I think one of the other thing, key things in there, how do you leverage um, you know, partners and stuff is that the more you can find a partner that can leverage a security product suite, instead of having 300 different vendors in, you, there's a there's a there's an advantage. Everybody's not going to do everything. There's, there isn't anybody out there that doesn't. I can name all the big names, and of them do everything perfectly. But there are some that do a lot of things really really well. And the more you can kind of stick with one of those players on 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 a handful or two of things, you have some real economies of scale you can build there. Um, and, and one other thing, you mentioned that you know this isn't necessarily down that leveraging line of uh, partners, but it kind of goes back to some things we've been mentioning here. And it's absolutely critical to take into account. We talked about how people coming into our network, we talked about connectivity earlier in our in our previous questions. Think about when, when your support vendors, the people you're partnering with come in and tell you, I need access to your manufacturing network because you outsource something to that manufacturer. Well, how, how are they gonna get into the network? Now you, do you trust these people to come into your network? Are they going to provide the security controls for coming into your network? That's exactly what they'll come to you and say in your SOW. Don't listen to them. <laughs> tell them no. And they'll tell you, well, that's the only way we can support you. And you tell them no again. And by, guess what? They want that contract just as much you need yeah. the service. They will find another way. They will listen yeah. to you. They'll come in on your VPN and your two-factor authorization that you control. Then when you get to the OT network, have them two-factor again. Yes, another set of two-factors. Annoy them. Make it hard. These are This is what that, that heat map looks like. You now continue to turn things that are red on this heat map of the cybersecurity framework. You're turning them green. And you're not letting other people control access into your environment. You're not giving these controls out to people that you have zero control over. These are the these are things you find people on the news about. <laughs> so right. just some more advice. Yeah. yeah and, and I mean, Mike, to your point, I mean, we talked a lot about risk and the, you know, and the specter of, of events that go on here. But business case is also a great motivator uh, as far as getting things done. Right. So just you said, I mean, this is this is early days in security and that resonates down the supply chain piece of it. So. Um, you know, one other thing that I heard you say, and we talked about it before, too, about ITOT convergence is that, you know, since we are talking about relatively new, you know, as far as security and that type of thing is that, yes, there's a there's a lot that needs to be done and a lot of gaps to be filled. But since it is new, like, don't lose sight of how can I keep, you know, have a priority also with vendor consolidation? How can I, you know, can, is there ways, is there a pathway to a platform? Is there a way for the ITOT convergence? Because we haven't mentioned it, but there aren't enough people, you know, out there to help us in this, right? I mean, there's always going to be this people deficit. Um, so you've got to be really smart about with our solutions and how they get deployed and operated. So, um, let, cool. Let, well, I, let yeah, me, go ahead. No, I just want to jump in because it's a pleasure yeah. to none. Uh, on a panel with two uh, people who have this kind of knowledge, it uh, <laughs> got to be very, very useful for um, uh, for for the uh, attendees and such. I, the only thing I wanted to add is, and I, again, you don't want me to miss this because I'm going to top the, the study. Uh, it's um, mm -hmm. so so um, in terms of OT ecosystems and partnerships, um, the the primary issue that we found in our study is the lack of internal expertise you're talking about an ecosystem it requires uh expertise on a number of different fronts and and everybody knows on this call if you're in manufacturing you know the top challenge in manufacturing for years now along with cyber risk along with global instability is it's a skill talent shortage uh, and frankly you know they all overlap um so uh and but now along with the shortages in production workers maintenance operators our manufacturers are looking for cyber experts who can understand industrial control systems, who have a proficiency in 
you know, identifying abnormal patterns in OT systems and such like that. So in our survey, because of this talent shortage, we found fewer than 10% of manufacturers actually handle all aspects of OT security with in-house resources, right? So you, you need an ecosystem. There's, there's just not enough internal talent. Two thirds of the people uh, in our survey tap a combo, you know, of internal and external security uh, expertise and 20% rely on third party expertise almost exclusively <clears throat> for the OT security needs. So the point is, and a, a uh, you know, an ecosystem, it, 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 it's going to look different for different companies, uh, but it's really important to recognize that there, we're, we're striving to get the internal talent. I think uh, these are great points yeah. to bring it up, Stephen, and it can't be lost that there are not enough people to do security to go higher. It's too costly. Everybody knows it. That's why there are MSSPs out there. You, you do have to take advantage of those and... Um, but it's a combination. You have the OT staff, and you mentioned something else that was uh, very important. What would you say, 10%, I think, end up being fully responsible? How in the heck can they be experts on an Allen Bradley system? And then all of a sudden have the knowledge, what you kindly said a moment ago, what you're seeing on this panel or others maybe on the call, right? It, it's impossible. Let no. them go focus on making widgets. Let them do what they're good at, right? Transfer that, and I'm, you know, we're evidence of it here of letting that responsibility be in the organization and the company that has the expertise, right? Now, we go back to the things I said earlier. You have to have an advocate. You have to partner with them. It can't just be thou shalt take that approach, right? It's a partnership. It's, it can't be an autocracy. It, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> you got you to gotta have that partnership, right? But yeah, that ecosystem involves that partnership. The IT organization has to recognize they don't have enough people either to go you know, make everything work perfectly, reach out, Use those partners that we mentioned a moment ago. When you're looking at the, those 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 MSSP partners, highly recommend unless you've got endless funding to go make a sock of your own and and can hire whatever you want. You know, some organizations have that, but most probably don't. Go go make that. That's the ecosystem though that brings everything together for that support mechanism. Put the expertise where it should be. Go make sure you're hiring enough people. But hiring doesn't mean an FTE all the time. There's MSSPs out there that are good at what they do. And you yep. don't, there's MSSPs out there, I'll just say, find one in which you're not a number. When you call them up and they don't know your name, go find another MSSP. I highly encourage. <laughs> good, good advice there. Um, I want to. I want to turn to the, some of the, the chat and, and Q&A that's going on um, just for a brief, and then we'll come back to the panel to kind of wrap up and, and we'll, you know, we'll talk about kind of takeaways and best practices uh, and close out the webinar. But um, the first one here is, is there's a, I'll take this one actually, which is a, a reference to an ICS malware attack. Um, and Dragos has a report, Mandian has a report as well, but Chevron Knight's uh, pipe dream. And so, um, this is a very unique attack because it's OT specific focus. Um, a lot of what, what we're talking today about is, you know, is general hygiene and doing kind of the blocking and tackling of security. This is about um, OT protocols and OT devices. And so to answer this person, this is uh, Julia Shi, um, that that specific malware set requires OT specific security measures and those are usually centered around ot protocols and then the vulnerabilities application vulnerabilities and signatures with on top of a standard ips so you got to be it's a very it's a very finite question but it also takes a very finite security solution in order to prevent those types of things um, the rest of it is covered under like it if you will um, so i just wanted to answer that one first um, and then to the panel the question here um, how should manufacturers budget for cybersecurity? Is this a fixed amount um, or or an insurance product? Um, Mike, go ahead. Uh, well, once you've got the board engaged and you got your CIO engaged and understanding, that, that's the first and foremost. You got to take the effort, whether it's bringing in a third party to help you show your gaps. If you don't have that internal expertise to show the gaps and we are vulnerable. You got you got to prove that, right? Okay, to some small degree, or give an assessment. Okay, now you've done that. Now you've got buy-in. Okay, that's what's going to drive your funding. If you tell everybody that the state is glorious, um, why do you need more money? <laughs> right? The state is not glorious. Be honest, uh, and then show how you're going. 
you know, take the heat map, build a heat map using the site that framework I've said more than once now, and start mapping the tools and the processes. Those things cost money, right? The resources you're going to need to implement and support those tools and processes. And now that dollars start aligning to a framework that has huge um, integrity, and you can take those dollars and that plan now to the powers that be that say, yes, we're over the money. You know, if we don't do this, this is what risk you will take on, not yourself anymore, right? You've presented that problem. You've presented the risk, right? It's all based about, it's all a combination of what risk exists, showing that exists. Here's the mitigation to those risks. Well, if you don't give me any money, you don't give me people, don't give me tools, you get to accept that risk. Right. That that's what executive that's why they get paid the big bucks, you might say. They're, they're, they should understand that. And they're probably not gonna want to accept those risks, not in today's day game model. Right. But yeah. you gotta present that picture. Yeah. Uh, Brian Steven, anything to add there as far as budgeting? Back to the conversation I think that's been weaved throughout uh, the entire uh, time so far is that it's an ongoing methodical approach. It's it, it's assessed. NIST is is very, very um, dynamic in the fact that it knows to add reassess now. It used to be linear, what happens before, during, and after an attack. It's now circular and with governance in the middle around this 2.0, right? So adding in what you do with your policies, standards, people, processes, technologies, um, it, it, it's an evolution and it's methodical approach of assess, what are my gaps, prioritize my gaps, prioritize my budgets around it, I think as we leave and, and get closer to the end, we're asked for some best practices. I'm often asked, where should I start? What should I do? Do the thing that you are that you can do and do the thing that you will do. Sitting around and constantly talking about what should we do is doing nothing. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a lot of things that you can do that don't cost any money. Not any money. It, it may be time and there's money in the time, but getting yourself organized around a real password change process. I know we've honed in on that a little bit jokingly, but it's true. There are there are procedures and policies that you can write that, that will only cost you organizational structure, which we talked about anyways. Get yourself structured. Get yourself a good policy and procedure. Get down the path there. And then you can start thinking about where your other gaps are and how you want to prioritize spending yeah. the money according to the risk. Yeah. Yeah. We're not going to we're not going to eat the cyber cyber risk elephant in one bite. Right. No, <laughs> no. no. You, Excuse only, me, go ahead. Only the other thing I'd ask is. Um, you know, scare the hell out of your CFO. And we have, uh, you know, we, we have a growing number of our companies, you know, once the CEO and CFO take this seriously, you know, it, it is, it, and because Brian, you just said it, this is going to continue evolving and guess what? It's not going to get cheaper. It's going to this, but <laughs> on the other hand, it's uh, if, if you can create the right systems and get the right training. And again, training has to be a huge part of this. Uh, it doesn't have to, have to be exponentially more expensive either. It's just something that, that companies are going to have to start setting aside uh, a, a yeah. certain budget for. Yeah. Um, I, just wrapping on the budget, I know it's a hard one and that type of thing, but I, I go back to the tabletop exercise, right? I mean, Clorox, again, these things that are now having to be disclosed, you know, there's certain aspects of it. And then they're also breaking it down from, you know, what is the um, recovery cost as well? It, you know, there's intangibles like reputational costs. I mean, it's talking about scaring the CFO, right? I mean, unfortunately, we're, you know, I mean, we should be leveraging these events um, in order to learn from them and then to, you know, adjust the calculus um, as well. But uh, let's uh, let's just wrap this up. We've got a couple minutes. Uh, Brian, you already mentioned kind of best practice. I'm going to turn to, to Stephen and Mike, if you can take us home, tell us, tell us something, uh, tell the audience what to do today. Go ahead. Steven, go ahead. No, no, I was, I was saying Mike, Mike's in a, probably in a, in a perfect position to, he, okay. he's given a lot of it already, which is great. Yeah, right. without being too redundant, I'll, I'll, do, I'll just kind of summarize in, in a few seconds here. Uh, find that model. Again, I, I've given an example of one I think works well. I have used that in multiple lives, you might say, different places I've worked. And it, it really works. If you are at base zero, you have no clue how to go improve security at your company. Or if you're, you've are done some good things, let's hope that's the case, right? But you're trying to figure out where your gaps are. Go take a look at that model. I'm not kidding. Lay it out. There's 18 of them in there, if I'm not mistaken. 
that each one of them talks about what a good security footprint looks like. All of them combined is the footprint, right? It, it covers all the things that we just mentioned, but it's going to make you start thinking, what do I need to do to meet that one of the 18? And it's it's generally a combination of the, the, the old ad is the people process the technology. But if you don't know what tool, you at least got a concept now, go ask your vendor, go get a Go get a broker that has some experts in the background that aren't going to charge you for that conversation, right? Because you're going to buy a product from them ultimately, and you know somebody you can trust, right? And get that get that going. Once you do that, you know it's probably a three year plan at minimum to go fix if you have a lot of gaps. If you don't have a plan right now, you, know, you got to get your operational base fixed first, right? You got to you got to get what's Get, be able to have some have some standards there, right? And then start enhancing your security footprint. Mike, I will I will add one tidbit I've I've learned from talking with lots and lots of CISOs. Some CISOs will will regret the fact that they do this. Some CISOs will do it on purpose, but NIST in reverse. They put their incident response plan in first as they build their maturity <laughs> because they know that they're going to have to do it. But those ultimately who do end up responding to an event also found out that all of the things that they've done along the way, there were holes and gaps in what they were doing. They were not doing the right assessments. They were not writing the policies correctly. They were not doing the right intrusion detection. They didn't have the right partners. They didn't have the right technology stack. They didn't have the right resources associated to the contextualization of all of the data that the technology was providing them. So NIST in reverse is kind of funny, but it, it, it works. And some people think about that as they build out three-year strategies and three-year plans is, Hey, let's sit down, tabletop exercise this, crown jewels, segment this tomorrow, asset identification, vulnerability management, prioritize, prioritize, iterative. It's funny you say that, Brian. One of the first things I think I did in, in multiple times of moving company to company over the years is <laughs> write the standard. What is yeah. my app, right? Yeah. And the instant response is probably like the first one I think I remember. <laughs> so, yeah. huh? <laughs> well, Stephen, go ahead real quick before we wrap up. You know, there's yeah. a natural conflict between IT and OT. You know, one of my IT members once said uh, he thought the OT was like the Wild West. They didn't report to him. You know, <laughs> communication between two groups was rocky. Uh, so you need to obviously look at best practices for IT OT collaboration. You know, you, if this is a, a, about which system reporting structure works that can best align these two. And, and, and my final thing would be I equate this to an offense and defense on a football team. They're both on the same team. Uh, they better damn understand each other and be talking to each other if they yeah. want the team to win. So that's yeah. my final guidance. Great. Well, uh, gentlemen, thank you so much. I think this has been a great, um, a great uh, opportunity to really have representation in all aspects. And, and we talked with the with the scary world out there. We talked about frameworks. We talked about teams. Um, but I think my takeaway here is change your passwords. Make sure you engage with somebody who answers your name, you know, knows your name, and then do something. So with that, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And thank you, IoT World as well. Um, and so be safe out there. Thank you so much and have a good day. Thank you.